kidding me? It's zoomed in. You gotta be kidding me. Official word to begin. Oh, go on. Okay, I, that's the official word. It's the first time. It's the first time anybody ever asked for my opinion for anything. But no, go ahead. Jedi blessing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for being here, Peter. We're looking forward to this. Okay. Here we go then. Um, what do I have? An hour? Yes. You have an hour, sir. Okay. Better dig in then. And then, yeah. if you're not on time, James Duffy will kick you off the podium. With... That's unlikely. That's uh, unlikely. Yeah. No, if I, I there's. Okay, maybe I should be rolling. Hi, I'm Peter Alway, here to sell you books. No, I'm not here to sell you books. Maybe yes, I am. Um, tell you where, where this talk came from. Ah, uh, Narns is running out of Rockets of the World. They're not out yet. But they're running low, and they're going to need more. And when I was told this, and they wanted permission to print more, I said, but, but, if you're going to make more, I want, I want to make the next Rockets of the World bigger. And I wanted to expand it in several directions. So there's going to be like things that hadn't flown yet when I last did Rockets of the World, which hasn't been really changed much since the first edition, actually. Um, and I'm going to do some missiles in there, obsolete missiles. And also, I want to go backwards in time. And it sort of happened, I've been, I haven't been doing any research for, for almost 10 years, stopped doing work on any of these drawings. And then I did a little Google searching, and I found on Google Books this, this 19th century book called Treatise on Ammunition. And it had dimension drawings of 19th century rockets. And, and I started going further back and further back, and I started poking around for all the ancient rocketry I could. And I realized that um, there's scaled data from other centuries. And so you could build scale models of things from other centuries. It just takes a little bit of poking around. So that's how I spent the past year, is poking around in previous century's rocketry. The first seven centuries of, of rocketry, 13th century, 14th century, 15th century, 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, and 19th. That's seven centuries of rocketry. And I've got samples from most of those. Next picture, please. Okay, first of all, rockets. We think of rockets as spaceships and liquid and solid propellant rockets. But in previous centuries, this definition is it. A rocket is a cylindrical tube of paper or metal filled with a compressed mixture of nitre, sulfur, and charcoal. That actually defined a rocket for centuries. Next, please. Okay, where do you go to find the beginnings of rocketry? Um, there's been talk about rockets come from China, but by the 1970s, scholars were saying, maybe they don't come from China. We don't really have proof of this. Everybody knows they come from China. Did you get the air quotes picture? Ah, oh, nuts. Uh, everybody knows they come from China, but do they really? And there's some doubt about this. Um, and the way to find out where rockets come from is kind of like, really, you have to go back to chemistry. And there's, there's gunpowder. And the three ingredients of gunpowder, charcoal from wood, 
Okay, that picture was taken in Ohio, this very state, um, in 1940, where basically all you do to make charcoal is you take wood and you heat it up without letting it get any air. There's a fire underneath or in the core of this pile of wood that is covered with dirt. And there they are making char charcoal in like 1940. Sulfur, which people knew about forever from volcanic rock. And there it is from a volcano in Indonesia. I love that picture. You can see all the fumes coming out. It's <coughs> great. Okay. And the other one, potassium nitrate from animal waste. And I didn't get a dramatic picture of it being manufactured there. But <laughs> <laughs> um, you ferment urine and feces and you get nitrates. You get uh, fixed nitrogen, you get fertilizer, you get bat guano, okay? And from that, you mix, you, you, you dissolve it, you mix it up with potassium in the form of wood ash. This is where Bob told me all the chemistry about this. And you do this little exchange thing and it turns your nitrates into potassium nitrate. And the way you know you've got something special is you get these neat little needle-like crystals. So, charcoal, sulfur, known forever. Potassium nitrate, that was discovered in China in around 100, year 100 AD. And then they were mixed together to make gunpowder. We know they had explosive gunpowder bombs by about 1000 AD. But, trying to figure out where rockets come from is a problem because Chinese for rocket is fire arrow, which sometimes literally means a fire arrow. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so you peek in and you shoot it off and you set the castle on fire like all the old movies. So, when did it really become a rocket? We can't tell. Next, please. Okay, <coughs> this is, I believe, the oldest description of what? Of, of rockets. Hangzhou, China, the West Lake, it's like this, it's still like a World Heritage site. It's this beautiful park with gardens and everything on the lake, and they have these boats that they're ornately carved, and so it's like many people went back and forth on boats and sleds and picnics and singing and fireworks. Some of these were like wheels and revolving things, others like comets. The comets seem to be actual rockets. And so maybe 1165 to 12, since the dates are fuzzy there. This is recalling earlier events. Okay, customs and institutions of the old capital. Yeah, go ahead. So, to get to the first rocket that we know is a rocket, we go to the Fire Dragon Manual of 1350 AD. By the way, my, my wisdom about Chinese rocketry comes from a book called um, Science and Civilization in China, which is about a 20-something volume set. And it's one of those volumes actually has multiple parts, but anyway, that's the book, Science and Civilization in China. And the oldest depiction of a rocket is right there, around 1350. That description, that book, not only has that illustration, the thing on the left is a rocket launcher, okay? It's just a tube with an ornate dragon head on it, and then the thing at the right is an actual fire arrow rocket. Um, there's no knock at the bottom end of the stick of the, of the arrow shaft for a, an arrow, so we know that that was self-propelled. And that is indeed a rocket. That's the oldest illustration of God of a rocket. Next. Okay. And here we see how these could be used in a basket. And you just shoot them all over the place. Notice basket, not arrow, not bow. So we know these are rockets, even though you can't see the little rocket tech, uh, tube strapped to the side. Next, please. Um, this is the long serpent enemy liquidating fire arrow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I've shown it here, it's a, a launcher of tw will launch 20 of them at a time. Um, and the text gives some dimensions for this one, like the, the diameter of the tube, the overall length, and I think the length of the, of the rocket tube. So this is a rare case where we actually have dimensions. Next, please. So, would you believe scale data for <laughs> a 14th century Chinese rocket right here um, colors? I don't know if he knows the colors, except the colors of the natural materials. How about the paper? There's no record of the paper's color, but there's something called the Flying Fire Lance, which wasn't a rocket, although some books you read will think that's the first rocket from around uh, 1230 AD. 
that had this pyrotechnics in quote a yellow paper tube. So I guess that's yellow. Anyway, those are the one at the the left is the oldest known rocket from 1350. The one at the right is the long serpent enemy liquidating arrow. And most of those dimensions are just taken straight off the drawing, but there are a few key dimensions that are known in Chinese units that have to be converted because um, a Chinese foot is 30 centimeters and a Chinese inch is 30 millimeters and there's 10 inches to the foot. Anyway, next please. Okay, now if I'm gonna talk about Chinese rockets, people are gonna bring up Wan Hu. Okay, and you know, turns out this is the oldest reference to Wan Hu. The, the, uh, the, the first record anybody's been able to find about this legendary uh, Chinese nobleman. Tradition asserts that the first to sacrifice himself to the problem of flying was Wang Tu, same person as Wan Hu. The Chinese Mandarin about 2,000 years BC, before uh, saltpeter or potassium nitrate was found, before gunpowder, before writing, but having constructed a pair of large parallel and horizontal kites, seated himself in a chair fixed between them with 47 rockets. The 47 rockets always shows up at 47. That's how you know it's the same person. The date of this original version of the legend, 1909. The place, Scientific American. Notice that date, October 2nd, 1909. That date is interesting, not because of that particular date, but because of a photograph taken of a very famous person who had just become a major celebrity after revealing a great invention. This photograph was taken three days earlier. Next, please. <coughs> The Wright brothers had just become famous by riding in a flying machine made of two kites parallel to each other in a horizontal plane in a seat between the two <coughs> kites. Okay. The unfortunate thing is it was a 30 horsepower engine and not a 47 horsepower engine. If it had been 47, <laughs> I'd be like, yes, there it is. There's one who. But I'm actually pretty sure that that is the inspiration of Wan Hu. And the beautiful thing about that airplane, it's within a mile here. The 1909 flyer is sitting in the Air Force Museum, right, right across from the gift shop, it's right there. Okay, first airplane you'll find. Uh, so that, when you go in and look at that pair of kites, think that's the real Wan Hu. Okay, next. The idea of the rocket spread pretty quickly. And in fact, we have records of, of uh, a Syrian writer in, in 1280 AD, which is even before the, the pictures I showed you. Uh, so they had reached the Middle East by 1280 AD, before we have really good hard text about them in China. Um, but we have those 1350 Chinese rockets these are Korean rockets from about 100 years later. Uh, there is a, a Chinese fellow who taught a Korean fellow the secret of making rockets. These rockets are in a museum in a castle in South Korea. Um, they are reconstructions, they are not originals. But it turns out that the bureaucrats in <coughs> Korea were very good about recording dimensions of these things. The length of the rocket tube. <coughs> the circumference of the rocket tube, labeled with great precision, okay? The lengths of the guide sticks, the diameter of the guide stick at the front end, and in the, or the circumference at the front and back end of the guide stick, the cord and span of the, of the feathers, all of that has been recorded. Although the feathers are the biggest of those rockets, which is about four inches in diameter, um, the feathers are too big to be the feathers of any known bird, and they were probably made of leather. You're thinking, why would they call them feathers? Well, look at all the fins on the rockets that you've ever built. How many have been built from fish? Okay. <laughs> Next. Okay. These beautiful drawings are made by the fellow who built those reconstructions for the museum based on this ancient text. <clears throat> Conveniently published 
in a number of historical papers, some of which I found online, some of which I found in the depths of the University of Michigan Library. And yes, there's all kinds of dimensions on those things that you can't read, but you can make them out with a magnifying glass, and I'm not going to show them to you. Neener, neener. Next picture, please. <laughs> okay, but maybe you can read them from this if you're really quick. Okay, this has the smallest of those, which is called the small magical machine arrow, and then the 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 one in the middle is actually just the head of the large magical machine arrow, drawn to the same scale as the small magical machine arrow. And then I shrunk it down for the whole large magical machine arrow, which is the one whose feathers are big, bigger than the feathers of any known bird. So um, anyway. So that'll be in the next edition of Rockets of the World if it comes off. Next. Okay. Now, I've been talking about rockets sprung from the historical record. This rocket still exists. This is a, a, another historical paper with, with some Swedish dude, because this is in a Swedish museum. I believe that's Ingmar Skog who wrote the article. With the oldest existing rocket in the world, built in the 1500s. So we've got the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s. We're getting a, a rocket from every century here. Okay, and next please. This is from the Swedish Royal Army Museum website, um, with some photoshopping to give it a less distracting background. Um, but the, 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 <coughs> the rocket itself is not photoshopped. Um, now you saw how big it is, it's about a human's height. Um, that big ball at the front is an incendiary ball. And in fact, you go to the next one, I just zoomed in on this so you can see it a little bit better. Trying not to touch anything here. That's an incendiary material, it's like tar and, and other chemistry thrown in together with three rocket tubes running through that incendiary ball. And you notice that that's the front end, right? The arrowhead is so that it would catch on a building if you fired it at a building, so that it would set the building on fire. The rocket tubes embedded in that incendiary ball, you'll notice that there's sort of at the back end a little indentation. That is the nozzle produced with a string um, to, to compress the tube, so that the paper tube, instead of having a clay nozzle, has been wetted, and then they pulled really hard on a cord to make essentially a nozzle there, okay? At the back end, there are these little things that allow this to fit into a larger tube, which may have been a gun. So it might have been a gun-boosted rocket, which then used the incendiary ball to set things on fire. So that is the oldest rocket known to exist. Now, fortunately, that historical paper, plus that very nice direct side view, is enough to piece together another scale drawing. So it'll be in the next edition of Rockets of the World if it comes up. Amy, I can't promise it, but I really hope it comes up. Next. Okay. The making of rockets in two parts. The first, containing the making of rockets for the meanest capacity. The other, to make rockets by a duplicate proposition to 1,000 pound weight or higher. This is a book dated 1696. It is a manual <laughs> produced by a guy named Robert Anderson, <coughs> who was a member of the Royal Society in London, who probably knew Isaac Newton. And um, that, that proposition went, the rocket mold. That is actually what you would slip the cardboard tube into when you started to pack with gunpowder. In fact, you notice that little semicircular thing in the bottom? That is to fit that constricted um, end of the tube where you tie it tight. Okay, so there's a rocket mold next. Uh, oh, and the C, thing with a C at the top, the big spiky triangle like this. That is the core, it's a core burner. At this time, all rockets were core burners whether they were made with a form, a spindle in the middle, or whether you <coughs> drilled them out, they were core burners. Um, and what you did is you poured in a little bit of gunpowder, you had a tool that had a hole in the middle to accommodate that spindle, and you went wham, wham, wham. And then you poured a little more gunpowder into it and went wham, 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 and poured a little bit more, and wham, 
plan of pounding as hard as you can on explosives um, <laughs> to get them to be compressed. Okay, that's just how rockets were made. Okay, remember that Bugs Bunny cartoon where in the end <laughs> Bugs Bunny wants to do his part for the war effort, so he's on the uh, ammunition factory and here comes this shell and he goes bing on the top, marks it dud. That's what rocket making was like back then. <laughs> okay. Then there's like the, the, the roller. I was trying to figure out what the heck this is. This, this manual isn't very good. It kind of jumps around. Make the body of the roller nine diameters in length and diameter two thirds of the diameter of the rocket and the head of the roller of the rocket the same diameter. And basically it's like there's a, a notch in it so that you can do that little tightening up of your tube. So that's what that's about. Okay, when it talks about things being choked. And then the ingredients which rockets are composed are saltpeter, sulfur and wood coal, meal and pasteurifying seed. First, take the largest of small coal made of birch wood. Secondly, choose the yellowest rock sulfur. Thirdly, take saltpeter, put in a brass vessel to which put much fair water as will dissolve it. Put that vessel upon the fire when it boils, scum it clean. You know, it's this great, great uh, archaic language for how to make your gunpowder. And first, you have to buy crappy potassium nitrate and purify it. Anyway, continue. Um, from that book, there are lots of dimensions. In fact, all the dimensions of a 1600s, a 1696 rocket, except the nose cone. So the nose cone on my drawing, I had to cheat, because I noticed all of the traditional rockets from the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s in Europe had about a 60 degree nose cone. If you think about it, a 60 degree nose cone is what happens when you roll a semicircle into a cone, or a circle that's got one slice out of it and roll it into a two layer thick cone. So I'm guessing 60 degrees. The rest of the dimensions on this thing, they are laid out as rules of thumb for how the proportions have to go. And notice you see the constricted nozzle there on the little cross-section view, and the pyrotechnic stars that are the size of hazelnuts. That's the only dimension I have for those. But uh, everything else is, it's a, oh, by the way, that this conical cavity that for the core burners was always called the soul of the rocket because you needed that high burn rate from a core burner with the quality of gunpowder they had at the time to get it to produce enough thrust. So that was the soul of the rocket. Okay, so this is actually very typical. No, let's go ahead with that. And I want to go elsewhere now. Um, all this stuff has been going on in Europe. In Asia, something went on. Nobody knows when this happened. But the rocket did work its way to India. Some people think maybe India had the rocket first and worked its way to China. But uh, these are Indian rockets from the 1700s. Um, and they, they are tipped with iron spikes. And they are iron-cased rockets. And then an iron spikes on the bamboo guide stick. Um, so that is an earlier sort. Uh, and then continue. Okay, then what happened in the 1700s is the English were basically taking over colonizing India. And as they took over India, not everybody in India was cool with this, okay? One of these people was not cool with it was a guy named Tipu Sultan, okay? He was a, a Muslim of the, of the Mughal group of people who had uh, migrated into India centuries earlier. And this guy liked the coolest things of, of modern technology. And in this case, the modern Indian technology was, instead of just having a paper rocket, the tube at the front end of this was made of iron. At the time, India had the best iron in the world. Okay, and by making your tube of iron, you could have a higher combustion pressure, you got more thrust, more range out of these rockets. That is, is, is strapped to the pole by leather strips. Now it turns out that uh, there are still in existence a couple of these rockets from Tipu Sultan. Next. These two, the one at the bottom looks an awful lot like the one you just saw in that picture with a bamboo pole. The one at the top, 
The guide stick is not bamboo, it is not wood, it is not even balsa. <coughs> that guide stick is an iron, it's a steel sword strapped to the side of the iron rocket casing with a fine lace of, of leather, okay? And the thing about this rocket is when you make your stabilizing stick that heavy, it affects the stability. Apparently these things, when they started to lose mass at the front end from, from burning gunpowder, they started to go a little unstable and they started to do a coning motion. Now, if you have a stick stabilized rocket that does a coning motion, it's kind of amusing, especially if it's going up. If you have a sword stabilized rocket coming right at you that's doing a coning motion, then what you end up is spiral sliced red coats. Okay, so these were rather terrifying. Now, the cool thing about this drawing, there's, there's a couple of measurements listed in the caption, and you can find those measurements in several books. But this picture was taken with two tape measures. So you can use those to get measurements of the lengths. And there's another picture, which I didn't include here, that shows a tape measure being hold, held right across the base of, of like, to give you the diameter of the stick. It's, it's, it's not a written measurement, but the tape measure is right, like, lying in the picture. So, <coughs> oh, this is one of those two rockets. It's at the uh, uh, Woolwich Arsenal Museum in London. And this is a nerdy curator showing off this rocket for a History Channel special. And the best thing about it, I have color data now. <laughs> okay, so next. That means that <coughs> there is enough to make a complete scale drawing of one of Kiprasulta's rockets from the late 1700s, from the 1790s. Now the best thing about this is, of course, you don't want to build your model with a steel blade, but you can build it with balsa, and if you kick out <coughs> some weight at Apogee, this becomes helicopter recovery with a flashing Mylar covered sword. I think that would be a great, I have to see where the CG actually works to, to see if that really works, but I think that would be what a, a really neat thing for mission points. Um, you know, that's the thing, these things are all modelable, um, and the, the specific impulses that they got with these things, like the, the Korean <laughs> rocket, somebody did a reconstruction, got a specific impulse of about 30 compared to 80 for a Estes model rocket black powder motor, which means that there's plenty of excess capacity so that you could build these with a legit recovery system inside. You know, they don't look like model rockets, they look an awful lot like <coughs> illegal fireworks, but you can build them into perfectly legit um, flying model rockets, often one-to-one -one scale. Next. I suspect qualifier for best Big West qualifier. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, those wonderful Indian rockets inspired the British to copy them because they were pretty damn scary. So, one of those guys was the son of the person in charge of Woolwich, Woolwich Arsenal, a guy by the name of William Congreve. Um, and he went ahead to develop a system of these <coughs> gunpowder rockets with an iron casing. Go on to the next one. There's some in a mock battle. It's a demonstration. These are some of the sizes about available. Right around the middle are the 32 pounders. I don't dare point because uh, that cable. But yeah, the 32 pounder, yeah, circling around the 32 poundiness. Okay, yeah. Um, and the pointy nosed one is an incendiary version of it. Um, okay, continue next. And this is what happens when you fire one of those incendiary, or a bunch of those from a rocket, uh, a rocket ship. Okay, the Erebus, the HMS Erebus was the world's second rocket ship. So one of those is a rocket ship. Not a rocket ship. Uh, anybody know the fort that, he's firing, that they're firing on there? McHenry. Not Sumter. McHenry. Okay. You've probably sung songs about that picture, right? Probably. Or at least one song. You know, the, the rocket red glare, the bombs bursting in air. That's it. It's a concrete 32 pounder. So, what's going on? Yeah. Thing at the top. Notice those lovely tape measures. There's also some measurements available of that. 
Uh, by the way, Congreve 32 pounders, it's not just that. Before the uh, Fort McHenry attack, um, there was the battle at Bladensburg in Maryland um, earlier in the summer of uh, 1814, in the War of 1812. And basically, the English wanted to attack Washington, and so they're going along and they're running into the, the Americans who are keeping the English from, from going forward. They got to this bridge in Bladensburg, Maryland, and the, um, the Brits loaded up a bunch of their Congreve rockets, fired them at the Americans, and they completely freaked and ran away. The biggest problem that the Brits had in, in taking over Washington was that the Americans were chickening out so fast they couldn't keep up with the retreat. Um, but eventually they reached Washington and they raided the White House. Well, it wasn't called the White House, the Presidential Mansion. And then set it on fire with Congreve rockets. Gutted the place and they had to repaint it white, which is why it's called the White House. So Congreve rockets have a big place in our history. Next. And there is scaled data of a Congreve 32 pounder uh, partly based on some solid dimensions that were measured at the length and then a diameter. Those are known. They were measured by somebody who actually got their hands on the artifact and the rest of fill in with the uh, aid of a tape measure. And the color is, what's that color? Dark blue gray or steel blue gray sometimes it's described as. Um, okay. And, oh my god, what are these things? <laughs> Um, there's, the problem with the Congreve rocket was that they were so bloody long, they had a 15-foot pole for guidance. And there's a guy named uh, William Hale who thought, you know, there's a better way. You could make these things spin stabilized because rifled guns were coming up, so the idea of a spinning rocket was a good idea. The one, I'm going to point and let you point it, this one here. That guy is, um, is the first type. Those four holes, there's four holes in the back next to the main nozzle. Those shot out tangentially to give the thing some spin. Um, and, and it didn't quite work ideally, and he went through some versions, but that original version he sold, before the British were willing to buy them, he sold them to the Americans. And during the Civil War, they were used by both sides. Um, so those are the hail rockets. The one, the bigger one, which I could have just said bigger or smaller, right? The bigger one is a later version, a 24-pounder, that was his final variation. And at the tail end, there are three nozzles. And those three nozzles, by the way, a nozzle at this time was a vent. There's no sense of a Dale Ball nozzle or anything. It was just a hole drilled through. And those nozzles had basically a half cylinder, gives you that kind of cool spiral look, a half cylinder on each side of the, on one side of each of those nozzles. That gave the rockets their spin. And it, and it stole less of their, their thrust. And they were used in England from, from the 1850s, and they stopped using them right at the end of the 19th century. Like 1899 is when they quit using these rockets. Continue. Okay, there's color data. Wow, it's red. <laughs> Just like it said in the Treatise on Ammunition, the British book that I found on Google Books, which is what got me started off on this crazy thing. Next, please. Um, here's a cross section. You can see that conical bore for the combustion, the sole of the rocket. Um, next. And there is scale data, so you could buy the next edition of Rockets of the World um, from NARPS if, if it all works out. Anyway, so there's, there's cool drawings of that. Okay, enough hawking books. Let's go on. Um, I love this picture. This is a picture from the report on foreign life-saving apparatus by the U.S. Life-Saving Service. And this is a British life-saving rocket. Um, you can see one in the foreground. By his feet is the rocket part that's got a long guide stick. And you see a rope from the, the one that's on the, uh, on the stand. There's a rope that runs from the rear of the guide stick into that little box called a fake box because in the nautical sense, faking is, is coiling or looping rope in such a way that you can unwind it, pull it out really quick. So if you wanted to do, say, a St. Louis arch type thing, you would fake the streamers. And if you wanted to fly this for mission points, you'd just do it the way you do a St. Louis arch. Next, please. 
This was a life-saving rocket, by the way, and I'll look at how that did its life-saving in a second. But here's a cross-section. The cool thing about this is there's this the middle illustration. I'll ask you to point to this part here. Uh, not to, not to. Okay, there we go. That that area there. Um, that shows that it has two <laughs> propellant brains. It would be as if you took two Estes B14s and epoxied them end to end. Okay, because there's actually a nozzle or port for the upper section. It's not two stages because the stages don't separate, but they're two complete rocket motors. Uh, the reason for this is that they didn't do end burning rockets and they wanted a gentler thrust so that it didn't snap the rope. And the way to get a gentler thrust was just to have two <coughs> core burner um, grains burn sequentially. So that saved the rope from breaking. And what you did with that rope is you pointed this at a ship which had hit the shore. There's a long story. Why well, I have a long story a note about it. Yes, the HMS Anson in 1808 ran aground uh, near Land's End in England, like that, the, the western extreme. And it was like 10 miles from its home port. And the weather was bad. They got blown to the shore. And it got cr crashed onto the rocks. Uh, the mast fell off. Some people escaped the ship across the mast, but then the mast blew away, and here was this hulk of a ship, you know, 100 feet from shore, and the people there couldn't get off. If they tried to swim to shore, they'd be killed, bashed to the rocks. And so the villagers were looking at this, and to their horror, you know, no farther away than the back of this auditorium, they just watched every single remaining crew member die. And this one villager who happened to have a lot of money said, there ought to be something you could do about this. A uh, guy had a name, not important, Henry Trengrouse. He ended up cooking up a rocket system that would carry a rope off to a wrecked ship. And he tested it out, and then uh, the people in charge thought, well, let Congreve do it, because Congreve knows rockets, and then Congreve didn't care. But it wasn't until around the 1850s that uh, a guy named Boxer, who actually took over Congreve's, Congreve's position, came up with this rocket, and now you can go to the next one. Okay, so what's going on here? Down in the front, in the foreground, you can see a little rocket on a tripod as an example. But mostly what you see is this big loop of rope. There are two ropes, three ropes involved in this whole thing. First, the rocket carries out a very thin rope. And the guys on the ship, the, the guy on the ground, shoots this rocket between the mass of the ship. People on the ship grab the rope that's attached to the rocket to pull out two more ropes. One of them is a big heavy rope called a hawser that they tie up to the mast of the ship. It's the higher, you see where there's double ropes? It's the higher of those. Then there's a loop of ropes called a whip line, and that includes the, the rope in the foreground and the bottom of the ones in the background. And that's a continuous loop. And tied to that continuous loop is a pair of pants attached to a cork lifesaver. So it's, 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 they call it a breeches boy. It's a, it's floating pants, okay? And what would happen is they would roll the floating pants, the breeches boy, out to the ship. One of the sailors would hop into it and then they would pull on the rope to bring it to shore. They're, they're in the process of pulling somebody to shore. Guy hops out reverse the direction with the loop of the rope and move the, 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 the breeches boy back out to the ship, and one by one, the sailors hop onto this thing and come to shore. Seems pretty awkward, but it worked. Uh, very quickly, people were uh, crashing into the rocks in situations like that. This sort of, of uh, rocket, mostly this one, but other sorts, saved 15,000 or more lives. Wow. Okay, at least 9,000 of this particular type of rocket off the shore of England. So this thing saved more lives than all the war rockets of all the previous centuries. So let's go ahead. Um, this, is, this rocket was used until 1948. This is a 1940 practice drill with one of the Boxer rockets. Next. This is in Australia, one of them being used as a, in a practice drill. 
about to take off, producing lots of good smoke. Next. And here is scale data. You can build models. Oh, the best thing. I showed you things from this report. It was a US Life Savings Service report. They gave all the dimensions you needed for this and the colors. The report includes the colors. It's like this guy named David A. Lyle, who I swear, I must have gotten a time machine and gone back and told them, record the colors and all the dimensions when you do this report. Um, and then when I went back to China, the, the time machine broke down or something. I guess I'll find out what happened. Maybe it's because I can't speak Chinese. Anyway, so that's pretty neat. Next. Here's the Russian version. Um, the Russians used a version with the stick was in the center. And if we go to the next one, you'll see some fun things about it. The stick is in the center, and around where the stick joins the rocket at the front, there are six little nozzles around the base. So those six little nozzles um, are, 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 the, are the nozzle the vents. Okay, so that's where the thrust comes from. And then it's a wood guide stick before, behind it. Notice there's a hook on that guide stick. That hook grabbed a ring at the end of a chain that would then pull out the rope. So the, the chain or the rope was not attached to this at launch, but as it left, it grabbed it. The problem is that, uh, oh, this is great. Um, the problem with this thing is that uh, the, they blew up every single one of them that they tested um, in, the, in the U.S. Over here. Either because of a, the, Over here. the transportation. There's, there's power outlets. Okay. Uh, either because of the transportation from Russia or because of a weak spot in the way that the, um, the, the guide stick was attached. This is going to be fun. Can he get power in without... Is combobulated. It is entirely combobulated. <laughs> okay. So we can flip ahead to the next picture. So you can see the chain there, and that runs to a rope that comes into the thinking box. And, ah, I, something's out of order, but that's okay. Um, this is not Russian. This is a German life saving rocket, um, with, which has been preserved by a group that has like a life-saving station that they restored and they have lifeboats and stuff. And they're showing off their 1910 version of a German life-saving rocket. This version, you can see there's like little, little prongs that hold the guide stick to the back of the rocket. So thrust kind of goes up between the prongs. Next, how did I get my order wrong? And here is the Spandau life-saving rocket, the German one, which has a chain hanging from the back, and you can see those prongs that support it. And again, um, Commander Lyle was kind enough to give full color data as well as that one color photo of a, of a relic. So we're in the late 19th century, late 1800s now. Continue. Okay, this version of the German life-saving rocket, check out that anchor at the front end. You would launch this, and then, it would stick to the bottom of the water, and a person in a lifeboat would then, when it was, the, the surf was too rough to row, they would just pull on the rope to pull their lifeboat out to the ship. So that's pretty crazy. Next, please. And there's scale data if you want to build a rocket <laughs> with an anchor in the nose. <laughs> which, who, would, who, would, who wouldn't want to do that? In the US, the, the the U.S. didn't have any in that forward life-saving apparatus thing. And in fact, the Americans didn't like the rockets for life-saving. They ended up using a cannon. This was an invention by an Irish-American named Patrick Cunningham. And the trick here is that the guide stick, which is the rear half in this illustration, the rear half is actually like the rear two-thirds or three-quarters of the real thing. The rear section has the lifeline inside the guide stick rather than on the ground. So it apparently it let things out a little easier and it got a much longer range also apparently. Figure three at the bottom is a rear view of the rocket part and it's got eight little nozzles around the guide stick. Okay, next. 
Here is Patrick Cunningham himself with a fake nautical backdrop uh, with one of his uh, life-saving rockets. Forward of, of his hands, above his hands, is the actual rocket part. Near his hands is like the front of the guide stick, and behind it is the cylindrical guide stick that carried the rope, which was like eighth inch wide rope, really narrow rope. Next. There are three of these in existence. This one is at Mystic Seaport, the Mystic Seaport Museum in, um, in Connecticut. And um, <coughs> it's, notice it's covered with dust. It's actually stored in a shed for, the, for a lifeboat exhibit. And so like, yeah, there's dead leaves and stuff. And, and it's, it's actually red, but uh, it's covered in dust because I don't think they recognize what a, an artifact they have there. But on the, the view on the, on the right, you can see off in the distance the little nozzles in the front rocket part. And you can also see the hole at the bottom where the rope was coming on. Okay, ready? Another one. Let's see, this is just the scale drawing showing that color scheme as best I could tell from the photo and they gave a description that mentioned some of the colors too. So anyway, next drawing please. Patrick Cunningham was um, went beyond just life-saving rockets. One of the holy grails in the in the 1800s for rocketry was the underwater rocket torpedo. Um, the problem with the rocket torpedo is that as it burned, it would get lighter and it would eventually come to the surface because it lost propellant. Uh, you'll notice it's, all, it's got spinning vanes to make it spin. This thing's like 18 inches in diameter, 15 feet or something. You can tell how big it is. Um, these things were a disaster in all the, all the sea trials. Um, but the best trial was like William Kinley as a presidential candidate. <laughs> he preferred William Jennings Bryan. And so in the 1890s, there was a big political rally for William McKinley. And Patrick Cunningham didn't like this. There were speeches and flags and everything. And he kind of presumably drank a little bit too much. And as a, as a, a prescient view of, of, of uh, oh God, Luke's name escapes me, um, Dr. Strangelove, he set up his, his torpedo on a street, on a major street in New Bedford, Massachusetts, where he lived, hop on the front of it, hop on the side, <laughs> hop on top of it, pointed it on this cart down the street, got a lit newspaper, tried to hold it behind him to light it up. His son, who apparently was not so drunk, managed to talk him into coming down off the torpedo, but they lit it anyway, running down the main street. And the thing took off, rolling along on its car, fell off, started scuttering around, went down the street till it crashed into a stump, which knocked it off the street towards a grocery store. It hit the grocery store, the grocery store collapsed, then it blew up <laughs> and sent debris like five blocks away. Um, nobody was killed. Um, I, I think the worst injury was somebody's mustache was singed. But, uh, um, he was arrested. But a year later, he was doing another torpedo <laughs> trial for the U.S. Navy. But the U.S. Navy, Navy wouldn't provide the ship to do it. He had to give it, do his own ship. So he took a schooner out, of a, a zone schooner, and, and launched some of these rocket torpedoes. And, you know, they went erratically. Then one came around and crashed back into his schooner and sunk it. <laughs> After that, he gave up on uh, inventing new rockets. And he invented some mechanical devices. Anyway, that's Patrick Cunningham, the first American rocket pioneer. Okay, next. Best the most qualified. Okay. This, got rockets of the world, you might recognize Alfred Ball's photo rocket. What you might not recognize is that weight up there, that counterweight, is actually a casing from one of those life-saving rockets. 
And this is propelled by a life-saving <coughs> rocket up right in the bottom of the head of that thing. The, the head of it has a camera. Next. Nice. Next shot. Okay, and there's the camera mechanism in the center. There's a gyroscope mechanism below it. The gyroscope would keep it from rolling. The fins kept it from pitching or yawing. And then with roll constrained by the gyroscope, the camera would point downward, presumably in, in a military situation at some sort of enemy emplacement. So if you go to the next shot, this is a photograph taken from his rocket camp, the model photo rocket, powered by those German life-saving rockets. <coughs> so they, they, those gunpowder rockets come back. Okay, next one. Okay, and there's scaled data. By the way, there is a connection here in that they were replaceable, reused. The, 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 the engines were, were removed and replaced, okay? Rather than a single-use rocket, it was a replaceable, replaceable engine. So it's very Estes-like, actually. Great camera. Um, yeah, and the only thing that I'm having trouble with is that some of these had a double rocket and some had a single but I think the one I have the photo of was was propelled by a single because you could see that pronged support taken from that German life-saving rocket. Okay, next one. <coughs> that last one was 1912. We're, we're running out of the black powder era, these first seven centuries of rocketry. And um, so this is a rocket created by a Frenchman named Le Priur. And this is a French Newport biplane. Uh, Le Priur's idea was, um, this is 1916 when it actually was approved. He had the idea for a long time of launching rockets from airplanes. But in the beginning of 1916, the Germans launched a Zeppelin attack on Paris. And suddenly, the French were freaking out about Zeppelins. And the incendiary <coughs> bullet didn't exist yet. And so Le Prieur says, hey, you launch a rocket at one of those Zeppelins, it's going to ignite the hydrogen and it'll blow up. And so they used, the, he, he finally got these things built. And there were a couple models that looked identical on the exterior, but they, they basically, you know, they looked like fireworks rockets. But they would ignite hydrogen either in a Zeppelin or a, uh, an observation balloon. Did anybody notice the big honking observation balloon in the s hanging off the ceiling of the museum? Yeah. I didn't. I had never noticed it before. And I looked up there, and it's like, yeah, Fran and Gary were there when they spotted it. It's, like, <laughs> it's a dragon, um, a, a dragon, a, an observation balloon. And the idea was these things were were vital for either side to direct artillery, uh, you know, across the trenches. So you could go up and, and fire these rockets into those and wipe them out. Um, so that was the trick of this thing. Next. And there's just a close-up of this. Notice there's like a triangular blade stuck in, that's a wooden, wooden nose cone that's had a notch sawed into it and a steel triangular blade so that it will puncture the skin of the, of the Zeppelin or the observation balloon. Were they electrically ignited? Or they were electrically pieces? ignited by a button in the cockpit. And there'd be like, I think you'd shoot them off in pairs, um, so that you'd have a little switch. So yes, they're very, very Estes-like in that sense. The only <laughs> modification for the airplane was the tubes that the guide stick stuck into, and the struts, which were made of wood, were given a, a metal protective <laughs> sheet. Uh, next one. This photograph shows that not only a French aircraft, but British aircraft, I'll tell you what the best thing about it is. The records of these rockets are good. <coughs> they didn't survive. They're, they're crappy workmanship. They were thrown in a box with hay. They arrive and they'd be broken when they arrived. The hay looked more like manure than hay. They were, you know, terrible condition. As far as anybody can tell, none of these survived. Um, and all we have are like some vague dimensions and I did find one source that had a precise diameter. How the heck can you get measurements to, uh, to draw this thing? Well, this Sopwith Pup is a classic airplane. The drawings show the distance between the struts. 
because it's the distance between the, the, the spars and the wings. So you can do that, and notice how this is a beautiful straight on dead side view. So with that, and knowing the diameter, you can actually get a reasonable set of measurements on the lay per year rockets, and then take people's word for it that they're right. Next. So thus, here is actual scale data, as good as you can get, of this 1918 rocket, which is a whole lot harder <coughs> to do than a Korean rocket from 1450, but such is life. Next. So, I'm done. What's it? I don't know what, how much time we have left. Got yeah, two minutes. Oh, excellent. My time is perfect. Um, here are all of those rockets drawn to scale with colors that are pretty reasonable. They range from absolutely known to pretty good guesses. Um, and you'll notice that some of them are pretty big when you look at these sticks. And some of these are four inch diameter black powder motors. Um, <coughs> impressive stuff. And uh, well, this, uh, aside from the anchor rocket, I think you could make any of these fly uh, as, a, as a legit model rocket. And the only, the only thing you have to worry about is people who think you're setting off fireworks because they look like fireworks rather than a, a model rocket, right? It's just an image thing. But I mean, even the, the things with arrowheads, you just make the arrowheads out of balsa, right? What? So this is a wonderful <coughs> collection of rockets that people haven't thought about. Before. So anyway, that's the first seven centuries of rocketry. Thank you. questions as long as I can get away with it, but we only have one minute. So. <laughs> Is there one question? What's the meaning of life? 42. <laughs> 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42. 42